I'm so glad that you've tuned in to one of the sermons from St Mary's. If you're new to our church and would like to find out more about being involved, please visit our website and drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, Jesus left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jesus had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Jesus' disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give become in them a spring of living water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say, that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as those to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he one who is speaking to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As we stand, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for that meeting with that lady at that well. And as we now take our seats, we pray that it would be in your presence and that we would meet with you just as she did in our own circumstances. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, please do uh, have a seat. It might be that you'd like to keep that passage open at page 97 uh, in the New Testament. So let me add my uh, welcome to Jennifer's. Uh, thank you to Martin and Jill for reading for us. And that, before we uh, tuck into that passage on page uh, 97, let me start with a confession. Uh, I stopped watching EastEnders in 1990, 
Uh, I'm not sure uh, whether uh, you're the same. It took me five years. I'm, I'm amazed it took me so long, but I come to realise after five years that basically every episode was the same. Uh, and before you got to those rather famous drum beats at the end, the kind of do, 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 and then the theme tune comes in, uh, somebody would usually find themselves crying, uh, isolated and alone, rejected and confused in the middle of Albert Square. Uh, and usually that was related to something in their romantic life. Either they've kissed the wrong person or they've just been found having an affair or they found themselves unexpectedly or expectedly pregnant. Uh, their neighbours didn't agree with who they were living with. Uh, perhaps their marriages were on the rocks. Perhaps some long lost relative had just returned from a distant land. But the standard storyline was always one of argument and of division and of curtain switching and of judgment and of rejection. And plenty of the bad news seemed to be based on the person's sexual and romantic conduct. The question before the drum beats was always, who's gonna be left out in the square tonight? And the reason that EastEnders is perhaps the most consistent crowd puller for the BBC, it still pictures at around about 6 million viewers per episode, is that it reflects in many ways everyday life. Now, the bad news of division and rejection and judgment and pain between people, often because of how they've conducted their romantic and sexual relationships, is a sad feature of everyday life. In curtain twitching, Instagramming communities up and down the UK, and amongst people of all ages, the question who's going to be left out in the square tonight is perhaps quite a resonant one. And sadly, it's not just EastEnders that reflects that brokenness and that judgmentalism and that bad news. So often, sadly, it's the church as well. Who's going to be left outside the doors because of their romantic conduct or their sexual relationships is perhaps a question that we need to consider for ourselves as well. Now, what does the good news look like? Can we offer as a church a better storyline than that of soap operas? A storyline that looks more like the welcome of Jesus. Well, if we have a look down at page 97 into that story, which we're now going to look through rather like a soap opera, uh, it's, a, it, it's a great gripping episode. It's got a beginning, it's got a middle, and it's got an end. And each of those sections of the story comes with a shock. So we're going to have a look at the three sections, and we're going to have a look at the three shocks that go along with them. And we're going to see that actually the soap opera of this particular circumstance is much more a story of good news and healing in what could be such a bad news situation. We begin, at no surprise, with somebody on their own in the square, uh, or at least by a well. Uh, Jesus needed to leave Jerusalem. The political temperature was rather hot at that time, uh, and so he'd left Jerusalem to go back to Galilee where he'd grown up. And that already tells us something about Jesus's better storyline, because he finds himself going through Samaria. Uh, the Samaritans were descended from the Jewish nation of Israel, but their ancestors had intermarried with the nations around them. And so the sexual conduct of their ancestors had had implications for how people considered the Samaritans' purity. Uh, it meant that the pure thinking Jews in Jesus' day would often take a detour of quite a significant distance to walk around Samaria to get to their destination rather than going through it. Jesus, for his part, pitches straight on in. And in verse six, he pauses by a well in Samaria at midday. His disciples have gone into town to buy food. 
and here comes a Samaritan woman to draw water. Uh, that doesn't seem like a particular surprise. It seems as if she goes to this well every day at midday. What seems rather a surprise is that it's an odd time in the heat of the day to go to the public well, until we realize that she's there precisely to avoid people. We'll find out later that she's had five husbands and the man that she's currently with is not her husband, but no one wants to be her friend. Everyone wants to reject her. And so rather than kind of confronting the visceral pain of that rejection in person, she prefers to go to the well when she knows that no one will be there. Except today, there is someone there. Jesus, verse 7, asks her for a drink. Uh, she's shocked, and on every level, this is a shocking storyline. It's worthy of those kind of East Enders drumbeats. She says, how is it that you, a Jew, brackets, man, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? It seems that Jesus hasn't read the textbook on ancient Middle Eastern relationships between Jews and Samaritans. He's clearly kind of, he perhaps wasn't in the lesson about community relations between those who had lived correct lives and those who hadn't lived correct lives. And maybe he was absent from the lesson on relationships between men and women in Near Eastern society. And so the surprises keep piling up. Verse 10, he says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Here is a bad news situation. A woman who comes to a well alone because of her sexual conduct, fully aware of the curtain twitching gaze of her neighbours from behind their curtains. But the surprise is that Jesus turns that bad news storyline into a good news storyline. He doesn't ignore her. He doesn't move away from her. He doesn't adopt appropriate social distance. He doesn't refuse to speak to her. He doesn't even look down his nose at her. In fact, he's happy to be needy in front of her. He says, I need a drink. And he's happy not just to receive what she offers but he's happy to give something to her as well and not just something but his very best he says to her I'd like to tell you about eternal life I'd like to tell you about overflowing wellness I'd like to tell you about restored relationship with God and others who's going to be left out in the square tonight because of their behavior who's going to be judged or ignored? Is it going to be the local sex workers on the downs? Is it going to be the unmarried couple who have recently moved in next door? Is it going to be the person who's been found having an affair? Is it going to be the person who's struggling with what they watch on TV or online? Is it going to be the person who's had a string of partners? Jesus shows that being good news doesn't necessarily mean agreeing personally with somebody's behaviour. Being good news means that in spite of the person's behaviour, we can still begin a normal conversation together. A conversation that dignifies the other person as a fellow human being. A conversation that doesn't plunge in with prejudgments or preconditions. A conversation that begins by establishing common points of connection. A conversation which loves the other person enough to offer them hope. Uh, if Jesus did that as somebody who lived perfectly, then surely that's something that we can do as those who might consider ourselves 
far from imperfect, far from perfect, sorry. Well, the storyline moves to the middle of the story and uh, Jesus and the woman uh, continue talking about the living water of eternal life that never runs dry. This is like the best advert in history. You know, the adverts that were EastEnders to have advert breaks, which seem to offer you the world and basically there's no cost implication in return. Uh, here, it seems that there's a kind of a living well that Jesus is talking about that's never going to run dry, a source of water. It's like free electricity or even better, free gas at the moment. The woman's really interested. Uh, and so uh, Jesus offers her this living water of eternal life that never runs dry. She's excited. She's interested. And then suddenly her bubble seems to be burst when Jesus says in verse 16, go Call your husband and come back. What can she say? She tells the truth. She thinks that Jesus is just going to reject her like everybody else. So she answers carefully. Verse 17, I have no husband. Jesus replies, you're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you are now with is not your husband. What you have said is true. Dun, 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 dun. You, you can kind of hear the music just wanting to, to kick in. But do, to her surprise, Jesus doesn't go away. She might be asking, hasn't he realized what he's just said? It's clear that by some God-given insight, he can see into her very um, difficult secrets. He's seen the real her. He, he's, he's seen past the outside. He knows what she's like, and yet he hasn't run away. He's still there by the side of her. She's not alone in the public square anymore. God's good news storyline is that he sees you and that he sees me and he doesn't run away from us. He actually runs towards us. There's no sense with God about us having a public life and a private life. It's all on view to God. And yet he's still there this morning, still right beside us. Whatever you thought of as we were going through our confession prayer at the start of the service, God hasn't run away. He's still there. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that he's going to cover up the complex realities. In fact, he's going to name them. You, you have had five husbands and the man you are now with is not your husband. But the naming of the reality before God isn't an invitation to be rejected by God. It's an invitation to be known by God, to be unhidden before God, to be vulnerable before God, to be undefended before God, and to receive life and healing from God precisely in those areas where we need him most. God's acceptance doesn't mean to say that he's not aware of our past failures. It doesn't mean to say that they don't mean anything to him. It doesn't mean to say that those past failures won't have repercussions. Uh, this woman's past history was still going to impact her current life in any number of practical and emotional ways. It doesn't mean to say that her and her, her, her past partners, if appropriate, wouldn't have needed to have gone through public court or the official legal processes. But it does mean that because Jesus has experienced God's judgment in our place, in God's heavenly courtroom, for all the mess of the broken relationships and sexual misconduct that this lady has been through, she's free to be accepted by him. He sits beside her and whatever she's done, he says, I'm still here for you. You're not alone. I wonder how we approach people who have messed up in their sexual and romantic relationships. 
I wonder if, like Jesus, we live a good news storyline of running towards people rather than running away from them. Of not running away from the pain and the consequences of the truth, but of dwelling with people within them. I wonder if our own attitudes towards other people who have messed up is actually a reflection of our own experience of God's grace when we've messed up. Speaking about another person who had sinned in this area, Jesus later said in the Gospels, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Whoever has been forgiven little loves little. The logical extension, whoever has been forgiven much, forgives and loves much. Well, finally, we come to the end of at least this episode of Jesus's life. Uh, and we might be thinking that the story deserves really a quiet ending. We, we, we've, we've been on a trajectory of healing and restoration. Uh, a shameful past has encountered God's forgiveness uh, and gentleness in that quiet square, we might be expecting a rather gentle ending, but what we get is a surprise. The woman goes away anything but quietly. In fact, she goes away really loudly. I'm not sure whether you've noticed the end of the story. Rather than kind of going back and hiding, suspecting that although Jesus has accepted her, her community will probably still reject her tomorrow, she actually goes back to that city that shunned her and starts sharing what she's gone through. Verse 29, come and see a man who told me everything I'd ever done. And then verse 39, we hear many Samaritans from the city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I'd done. Suddenly, kind of the good news of God seeing our hearts has become good news rather than worrying news. Her brokenness, which has been named and forgiven by God, is now her story. And it's a story she wants to shout about Although the city rejected her, she's running towards that city with a message of good news and of God's love. They might have rejected her, but she wants them to accept, not so much her, but to accept Jesus who has healed her and has forgiven her. A society that shuns those who mess up will never be able to listen to their stories of grace. A society which shuns those who mess up runs the risk of being woefully hypocritical. The good news is that a society that runs towards the brokenness will find forgiveness in its own brokenness. It'll find encouragement and courage to expose that brokenness to the God who sits beside sinful you and me, just as he sits beside that woman. At the end of John chapter four this morning, there are no drumbeats of doom. Uh, there's no need for a cliffhanger. Uh, there's no need for anyone to sit alone in the public square today. God says, I see you. I see how you've screwed up. But I've run towards you rather than away from you. And that's because I love you. And I want you to know my forgiveness and the restoration that I bring. And although you, the past might still have painful consequences, I'm still going to be sat at your side through them all. Amen.